This is Talking With, Brian Lamb's conversation with historian Douglas Brinkley. Episode 4 starts after this. First met you in this facility we're sitting in right now and interviewed you about this book, The Magic Bus, uh, which made it, interestingly enough, didn't know at the time, it was 1993, that it was going to have a big impact on this network. We just shut the buses down after 27 years. And so the Magic Bus made a big difference on this network. It went all over the United States, all 50 states. We had the two, for a while there were yellow buses, as you well know, and you've appeared on them. But I want to go back to the person, and my memory is there was a Russian American in one of your classes that gave you the idea of going around the United States. Well, the magic bus is one of the best things I've ever done. It's um, uh, it's the thing I may be, in the end of the day, most proud of. Wish I could, was still doing it. Uh, we would take family vacations growing up. You meant, We mentioned me visiting historic sites in Ohio, but we had a Pontiac station wagon and a 24-foot coachman trailer, and we had our dog, Hector, and my sister and I, and a trailer full of cold cuts, and we would go around the country camping, Uh, and some of them in parks and some at the old KOA type of places. So I really saw the lower 48 as um, by the time I went to college um, and fell in love with the country. I still love, I mean, if I had written on my tombstone, I wanted just to say I love America. I just love the diversity of our country and the places we, I would travel and see. And on the other hand, that music I were talking about, Ken Kesey, who wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, novelist, had a bus uh, named Further, and, um, and then there was like whole idea of rock and roll tours on a bus and, uh, and all of that. And I was at teaching at that point at Hofstra, but it was more about coming east when I went to Georgetown and then now I'm in New York. Um, there was a provincialism. Uh, they, they they were provincial in this sort of prep school world, and they didn't really under. I felt they there was a misunderstanding of Montana or Nebraska or Alabama that they were you know or Texas like everybody in Texas wears cowboy hats or says you know uh, is and ha- has an oil derrick in their backyard you know it's just that and, and it happens everywhere provincialism so I thought. And then I had gone to Europe once on a Let's Go Europe pass where you'd get a rail pass and you can go to all the countries on the trains. Well, we don't have a train system like that in our country, so the only way to do it is bus. And I just started um, figuring out, let's do a class called American Odyssey. A woman named Linda Longmere at Hofstra and I went for a summer with kids to Middleburg, the Netherlands. And I did a bus tour through the Netherlands doing Dutch history, um, which was, you know, I had to really learn a lot, and it was great. But I thought, let's go grab America by the scruff of the neck. And it's only because, Brian, I had done the Atchison book, and I did Driven Patriot on Forstall, and that book did, ex- you know, exceedingly well uh, with for Knopf. Uh, but they both got reviewed in gr- amazing ways. And those are pretty establishment figures that when I went to the president of Hofstra and said, I want to take students on a bus traveling the country all over for a semester earning credits, that they didn't throw me out of the room. You were 31 at the time. Yeah. And I, th- they knew I knew what I was doing. My classes were popular. My books were good. And I said, this is, what I, this is the way to do it. And to their credit, they they went with it. They, you know, they asked all the right questions about insurance. But the question was, what bus? And so I went to the um, NASA Coliseum, um, in, where they had a, a, a recreational vehicle show. NASA County, Long Island. Yes, in Long Island. And there, um, I f- met a guy named Frank Perugi, who had a bus that he called a highway hotel. And he looked like Buffalo Bill. Uh, I mean, he almost like, I think, purposely tried to dress like Buffalo Bill. And um, a wonderful guy. And we talked, and I looked at it. It was just what I was looking for. It wasn't fancy, uh, but there was enough room, a bathroom, you know, speaker system, air conditioning, you know, basic stuff. Beds? Beds of sorts, uh, little rooms, like with bunk beds, yeah. And um, 
and so we we I went with it, and I presented it back to the president and back to the provost. And so on the eve of this trip in 1992, uh, to my surprise, we were loading on the bus. A New York Times reporter showed up uh, that Hofstra um, had notified about this trip. And they did a story in the Times of the sort, while other kids go to Fort Lauderdale to party, these kids are learning American history. Uh, Really nice, solid article. And that started getting mail to me, people calling, how can I do this trip? Uh, It became a, a thing. And in fact, that New York Times article is why that book was written, because Lee Haber, who now is the key person that does Oprah Winfrey's life, works for Oprah all these years, does O Magazine, but more than that, really is like this with Oprah. She called, I talked to her on a phone booth in Kansas uh, where she said, I want you to do a book. I read that New York Times story. Are you taking notes of your trip? I really think you should write this. And and I subsequently did, and I've stayed in touch with Lee. I talked with her a couple weeks ago. There's a quote from that book by Alexander, is it Citron? Uh, Russian Jewish immigrant who said to you, one of your students, why can't we learn American history across America rather than here on Long Island? Yeah. yeah so you, and Do you, you ever see him anymore? I stay in touch. They, these people write me letters. You know, most of the Magic Bus students, I did it year after year. Uh, most of them stay in touch with me. I mean, they... I'm every week I am talking to at least one and usually two people that were on the magic bus. But do you remember this guy? Oh, oh my God, I adored him. And he was a um, um, a very funny kind of long haired uh, uh, Russian kid with a great sense of humor who um, really did. I mean, he came here, suddenly he's on Long Island and he really wanted to, you know, see the United States. He wasn't kidding. And, yeah, I was very, you know, drinking coffee. Things have changed. I was really loose talking with students, like, let's go do that. that, You know, Uh, my office would be like a beehive of students coming around and, you know, and and ideas. And this one just took fire. I mean, there was a hunger for American Odyssey course. I would assign the books. Uh, we mix it. Uh, we had so much fun because we would go to a ranch and do branding or we would visit a factory or we would meet a top poet or we would, uh, you know, go to uh, visit Martin Luther King's Auburn Avenue or, you know, John Steinbeck's Salinas. And it brought everything to life. And I had fun and no interpersonal problems. So go, go back to the <clears throat> here's a student wants to get on this bus. What did it cost them? Less than if they stayed at Hofstra. And because we were living on the bus, they didn't have to pay a dorm fee. And we would do group cooking meals, like, you know, hamburger at the fireside at a park. And I was able to get some hotel chains like Marriott to, um, say, in Hilton, um, to put us up occasionally for free and allow us to eat their salad bars at, you know, their places once in a while. Um, Just because I wrote a letter to the public relations said we're traveling America. A lot of those um, chains were very friendly. They just said, look, if we have, if we're booked, no. But if we have a lot of vacancy, we'll give you some rooms. Frank Perugi drove this bus. Yeah. And you left Hofstra for how many weeks? Well, 92-1, I think we did... um, Again, that's the first one um, that we did. We were the the course was eight weeks. It was an eight week course. Stay out on the road for eight yeah. weeks. And how did they have time to read? Well, that would be the one complaint. Some people. Well, I had a rule on the bus, a saying in the front that came from Henry L. Stimson that Atchison used to like, which is complaints are a bore and a nuisance to all and undermine the serenity essential for endurance. Complaints are a bore and a nuisance for all and undermine the serenity essential for endurance. The one rule I had is I don't want to hear your problems. I not do I'm going to enjoy this trip. I want to learn, but everybody's going to have bad days. Every no whining basically. And 
And that was it. I mean, I was really hard on that. No interpersonal issues. I mean, people would ask, well, how do you get along? Da, 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 da. It would never happen on any of these trips because people were just so, it felt privileged. Like, my God, I get how old to escape. Um, 21, I would guess, average age. And how often did they have to read, though? Oh, we'd read all the time because I gave them in advance the reading list. So they had, in order to get in it, it evolved, Brian. The first year it was novel, but once you're getting New York Times press and all, it became a big deal. But every year I would make people, you know, read the books some in advance. So when we first meet, we would already be taking a test, uh, you know, on books before we even got on the bus. So meaning if we're reading a Willa Cather novel, I would require it before the class started. So when we go to Nebraska to Willa Cather's homestead, they'd already read the novel. But then we would read live on the road meeting writers. We would pull in and saw Arthur Miller and have the students read Death of a Salesman. And they would sit in Arthur Miller's house and talk with them about why he wrote that novel. We'd meet with Toni Morrison. Uh, we, we'd meet with um, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who, who just passed. Uh, uh, we had, I got involved, uh, Waylon Jennings uh, on the bus. I had Kinky Friedman, Towns Van Zandt, um, Bo Diddley uh, did a seminar. And I, so I'd have doers uh, what, peop- come and do a seminar. What um, was Waylon Jennings like? Oh, Waylon's hosted us all to a party in California, and then we went to his concert. And um, I, a guy named Myron Crockett, an African-American student, thought it was hilarious that the, there was used to be a show, The Dukes of Hazards, which the, uh, Waylon had done a theme song for. And he had uh, said, I, well, if I'm going to see Waylon, he's got to do the Dukes of Hazzard song. <laughs> and it wasn't normally, I think, in Waylon's thing, but Waylon said, well, if you want to hear that, I'll play that for you tonight. And he did it. <laughs> He was a really nice man, a mensch. I got connected to Waylon through a friend who, you know, um, but what, 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 beyond seeing Waylon Jennings in concert, I wanted Waylon to talk about Buddy Holly and the crickets and early rock and roll and, you know, and so he would do a seminar on that instead of me lecturing on, you know, uh, Beale Helley and the Comets brought in rock and roll and, you know, or, or something. Here was Waylon Jennings telling his stories, much like you do on C-SPAN, uh, talking to people. I want to uh, <clears throat> read a quote from you in the book, and I want you to think of it in terms of other PhDs, professors in the classroom hearing this, and also people who run universities. You say, I promise you that in six weeks, these students will learn more about American history our writers, our culture, our music, our president than they would in four years of a normal university. Yep. I, mean, I believe that, that. But see, that just that basically says, why go to college when I can do this? Well, if you have a, it, it's it, there's some truth to that. Um, they, you know, I had painted on one of the later buses an Emerson quote: "No, there no, no truth but in transit." Um, you know, it, you've got to supplement it with reading, though. If you're going to try to cheat on it, it doesn't work. Meaning, it, it's if you're going to read on Gettysburg, it really helps to visit the Gettysburg battlefield. And one of the things I took advantage was is that local. We have great historians in our country, and they're working all these sites, and they're a storehouse of knowledge. So if you're going to get a park ranger take you around Gettysburg, you can ask that person any question and they'll answer it. I mean, anything you want about it, but you've got to come in a little prepared of what, you know, when was Gettysburg and why did it matter and all in order to ask the right questions. But I love local historians all across the country that are running museums and state parks and houses. They're always accommodating and I think it's an one of the most undersung spots uh, uh, parts of our country and if I I kind of am doing it with conservation I want to preserve historic sites and forts and you know it's a nonprofit kind of passion of mine but so in many ways I'm just the shepherd leading the flock to here as the expert I mean we um, we have no idea the interesting different people we we would you know meet on uh, you know, everywhere. And that's what makes it so 
amazing because now the students want to learn more about that thing. They want to learn more about the Civil War. Because of you, our buses went all over the United States and captured the same thing you're talking about with local historians. All of that is available free of charge on our website for people who are interested in hearing this and interested in history. How many specific bus trips did you take total? Um, probably, I believe it was five years in a row. Um, we would do them out. So from Hofstra, then we start doing them in New Orleans, the University of New Orleans. And then I started taking kids on civil rights tours where we would just do, and you guys at C-SPAN covered some of that, where we would go on a civil rights tour. The big year after this book came out, But in 1993, um, I had a natural gas. I had the buses run on natural gas. One thing that occurred in that book, Brian, that you read, The Magic Bus, is when we were in Northern California driving the Avenue of the Giants with the great redwood trees, and Frank's bus was just churning out the diesel. You could see the black clouds (laughs) coming, you know. And I just questioned, I said, there got to be a way to take a bus around um, you know, that's not run on that kind of diesel going into pristine areas like that. Uh, and so I started by, honestly, a dial the Department of Energy who put me to this person, to this person, to this person. And suddenly I was talking to somebody in Colorado and said, you can't do it on a hydrogen fuel cell. And all the easiest thing what you're looking to do is natural gas. Uh, you could run the bus on na- a natural gas bus. And then I got connected to Ohio, my home state in Columbus, where um, the, I was able to get a buses that were natural gas buses. And now I use two buses, not one. And to tell you, I don't know if you even knew this, but that year riding with me on the magic bus was a young writer um, who lived on the bus with all my students named Elizabeth Gilbert, who went on to Right, eat, love, pray, right, eat, love, pray, which has sold a zillion copies. <laughs> was um, she a student? Um, she was interested in my approach to teaching because of the book and said, I want to ride a board. If somebody wrote me like that, I'd say, come on board if you want to. And she ended up writing a, a long essay about the Magic Bus for Spin Magazine, which was then like an alternative to Rolling Stone. So did, did you do five different trips or yeah. five different years? Years, different different trips. Uh, and why, I know, I've heard you talk about a young person that's now already starting to try to do this. There are a number of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hey, and, and how do they do it? Do they do it any differently? Well, I'm dealing right now with a young um, woman professor at um, down at Stephen Austin in um, Texas. And she now had trouble finding the type of bus I did, but she's found these super-duper vans, uh, which aren't good for... Um, obviously, sleeping. They're, they're, they're like, it's like a stretch van. So... Um, we're, I'm going to help her. I told her, you know, I don't always try to help when I get these letters, but uh, I wanted to help her. And I told her that the key that she's missing is trying to get these hotel chains to give her some rooms. Like she's thinking she's going to camp, you know, Big Ben National Park. And then, but you, you, the, we need showers. People need to get a rest. People need. So if a Hilton would do it and they they're much more friendly if they show you know so i'm going to help her try to get some rooms for her trip but she was doing it leaving in august for a whole semester and doing exactly what i did and i just unfortunately had to give her the hard call because she's always asking my honest advice i told her to postpone it a semester due to covid i just don't know what the fall's going to be like um yet uh, I said, why, why can't you do it the next semester? And, and then she talked to her president of her school, and he agreed. Go they, back. they gave her 10000 bucks extra money. They felt bad she had to switch it. But at any rate, I have about four people like this right now that I'm helping that were inspired by the magic bus that I help. How many credits? Um, they're doing like 20 credits. You know, So my after Hofstra, so many students wrote, like, say, uh, um, to me... From all over, I had George Bush's goddaughter on my bus. I had two Native American students from Haskell, um, a 
Admiral Thomas, a, a naval admiral, um, I believe he was the second black admiral in American history, ran Davenport College at Yale. I had, um, I think, three Yale students living on my magic bus. I had students from University of Virginia. Um, did, you, did you sleep on the bus? Yeah, we all did. What we would try to do is camp. I mean, when you say sleep on the bus, uh, people would be, while we're driving, on their sleeping bags, writing, journaling. But then we would get off and go to, you know, we had it figured out every night, either a campsite, a place to park. So you didn't drive overnight? Mm, no, because the driver couldn't keep driving that much. I mean, l legally, he probably overran what he's supposed to, but for insurance purposes and all, he can only do, you know, I think he was supposed to only drive eight hours or something. He'd probably do ten but um, we, then we would try to make our designated campsite, like at a state park or what or went somewhere. wrong? What went wrong? The engine broke. We had we had um, one magic bus trip. We went all the way up to Alaska, uh, up to Fairbanks. You go the Alaska Highway to get there. Yeah, to? and uh, and we touched the pipe um, because we were debating whether the trans, uh, you know, Alaska mm -hmm. pipe's a good idea, bad idea. But we were, uh, and. Um, and then it broke uh, pretty seriously, and we got a little bit marooned. Um, that was really the worst thing. If the bi I mean, but sometimes it would break, and you have AAA, and they fix it real quick. It's something small, but this one had to get a rehaul. And we once, because one of the two buses had a problem, I had to get a third bus in. See, but I started partnering Brian with the. Um, Columbia gas people, natural gas in Ohio, so I could call them and say, they were, I was a guinea pig for natural gas, um, which did fulfill what I wanted to do. You could put your face behind a natural gas engine and, and not have the black diesel. That's all I did. I just wanted to have a conscience where I wasn't ch doing diesel. Natural gas has its pros and cons too, but it was a cleaner energy. Uh, did, and, and so I called it, you know, I, I wanted to experiment with that. Did you have one of those situations where you had a student that, I don't know what to say, bugged everybody, was unusual, caused trouble, and you had to ask to leave the bus? No. You know, not, you know why? Because I never had, um, they, they never, they were good young people. I mean, we would scout them. I mean, you're, it's like a, getting applicants. I mean, there were some issues, but you'd usually be involved with, um, you know, no drugs allowed, including marijuana. Period. I, I, I be my career be over because I, I had to make it really serious, guys. Yeah. Do you have anybody <laughs> with you helping you? Um, yes. A guy named Kevin Willie came along, helped. He's now in Shreveport. Um, um, you know, we yeah, but we had um, you know, I'd have somebody, uh, a, a woman named Beth Neville from Hot went from the Hofstra year. Um, you know, she came and helped. So people would, I'd always have a co-person helping with things. It was, it, Beth was great because, um, you know, she was great at booking advanced things. The key is just where are we spending the next night and what are we doing? It Just keep it moving. Douglas Brinkley is an American historian and author. You can listen to more interviews with him by searching Douglas Brinkley in the video library at cspan.org.